Okay, so thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, I'm here to introduce Michael Gandal, who's Assistant Professor at UCLA and the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior. He's a graduate of Stanford University and UPenn. He completed his psychiatry residency at UCLA, then moved to the laboratory of Dan Geschwind. Uh, Dr. Gandal now uh, is part of UCLA, which he joined in 2017 where he runs his own lab studying uh, employing systems level functional genomic approaches in human brain to understand the mechanisms underlying psychiatric disorders. Um, his title today is Leveraging Human Brain Transcriptomics to Identify a Convergent Molecular Pathology of Psychiatric Disease. He said that he's, he's happy to receive questions at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so it's, it's usually in the middle of your screen right at the bottom. And if, you, uh, and if you ask a question, he, uh, I will uh, I'll view them and put them to Michael at some point during the talk, but it may be at the end. So uh, that's all the introduction I, I think we need. So Michael, uh, uh, over to you. Thank you, Andrew, for that very nice introduction. Uh, thank you all for um, listening today. It's really quite, quite an honor to be able to present our, our work uh, at the PGC Worldwide Lab meeting, and I'm really excited to share uh, both some of our data that's been recently published and then also um, some some data that's uh, that hasn't been published yet. Um, so uh, as Andrew mentioned, I'm going to talk about our work using transcriptomic um, measures to understand molecular pathology uh, across multiple different uh, or distinct psychiatric disorders, including autism, schizophrenia, and, and bipolar disorder to, uh, to a lesser degree. Uh, so my talk today is going to have sort of four parts. First, I'm going to uh, spend just a little bit of time um, discussing some of the genetics first approaches that, that we take in autism um, and then uh, discuss some of our, our work looking at uh, cross disorder phenotypes um, using a microarray data set that's, that's recently been published and then um, move on to focus on some unpublished work as part of this like ENCODE consortium um, looking at uh, using RNA sequencing to measure distinct transcriptomic features, including gene and isoform level changes in psychiatric disease brain, um, and uh, looking a little bit at trajectories of, um, of gene expression alterations over, over the lifetime uh, in individuals with, with psychiatric disorders. So hopefully don't uh, have to um, sell many people uh, in this audience on why uh, we think genetics first approaches for understanding psychiatric disorders like autism are, are quite important, but um, we, you know, we, we have the challenge of taking these diseases with very uh, heterogeneous uh, symptom-based um, symptom diagnoses like autism with both a number of core symptoms and a number of uh, highly comorbid features and trying to understand uh, whether these represent some sort of un uh, unifying biological uh, construct or wh whether there are sort of convergent biological mechanisms that are, are leading to these types of behaviors. Um, and genetics uh, really seems to provide quite a, a very tractable foothold for beginning to understand the mechanisms of these disorders, uh, given the history of family-based population twin studies that show the substantial heritability of disorders uh, like autism and, and schizophrenia with an additive genetic component of, of at least 50%, if, if not uh, likely much higher. The challenge in autism has been to really dissect that um, genetic component down and to identify individual uh, genes. Um, the uh, early um, history of the field uh, um, was remarkable in that there were a number of uh, medical syndromes that were identified that were highly comorbid with a diagnosis of autism. Uh, disorders like Timothy syndrome or Phelan McDermott syndrome, um, which with much higher uh, prevalence of uh, aut autism comorbid diagnosis than you would expect by chance. But all of these are, are very rare and, and carrying a number of additional comorbid uh, syndromic uh, features uh, along with an autism diagnosis. Um, and recent work um, using both modeling and um, exome and genome sequencing has been able to sort of uh, uh, um, take the uh, proportion of liability for disease and partition it into different contributions from different classes of genetic variation. And currently, it, it seems that common genetic variation um, 
with minor allele frequencies greater than 1% are, are going to be, uh, or are predicted to be uh, very highly um, uh, um, convergent for um, conferring liability for disorders like autism, schizophrenia, although rare genetic variation as well, both inherited and de novo seems to, to play an important role, especially for things like intellectual disability as well as uh, for, for autism um, to a slightly lesser degree. And so uh, a challenge has been that we are starting to um, identify a number of genetic uh, variants, including uh, common polymorphisms, as well as uh, rare variants from, from these sequencing studies, um, likely predicted to be over you know, hundreds to thousands of, of variants conferring risk for multiple disorders. Um, but none of these are, are, have yet to uh, account for more than, say, 1% of, of overall cases of, of disease. Um, these are likely to function in additive um, effect, uh, additive um, means and um, are complicated by quite a uh, degree of pleiotropy, um, where you know one variant is conferring risk for multiple different disorders. And so, while gene discovery efforts are undergoing and are quite important, and and we um, uh, are are very excited to to see these uh, larger cohorts. Um, be um, put together for, for gene discovery efforts. A critical challenge that, that we see kind of facing the field moving forward is how do we understand what the convergent biological impact is of many of these risk factors? Um, do they sort of converge on specific pathways or time points or regions um, in, the, in the brain that can give us a, a better idea for the neurobiological mechanisms that are, that are contributing to these disorders? So the approach that we have taken and, and both in the Geshwin lab and um, that we take in, in my lab now is to invoke the central dogma of biology, understanding that all the genetic variation uh, is going to potentially converge onto um, altered levels or uh, expression patterns of, of um, messenger RNA or, uh, or different classes of RNAs uh, within a cell and that and that focusing one step downstream from the uh, genetic variation um, provides a means for um, uh, potentially me measuring factors that are integrating the uh, effects of multiple upstream genetic variants. Um, and so we use the transcriptome as a convergent quantitative, highly, uh, highly quantitative molecular phenotype to try to understand um, uh, convergence of, of genetic factors. Um, and one of the challenges of using the transcriptome for understanding psychiatric disorders is that tissue really matters. And so this is a really nice paper from Hilary Finnecane and, and Alcus Price um, from a couple years ago, showing that the GWAS uh, studies for schizophrenia and bipolar are strongly in enriched for regulatory elements um, very specific to the brain. And so we feel that uh, and, and, and our um, experience the uh, you know brain tissue is, is very distinct from a transcriptomic um, standpoint than other tissues and so uh, our strategy has been to um, acquire uh, case control cohorts of uh, postmortem human brain samples across multiple psychiatric disorders and to profile the RNA and to uh, characterize whether there is a, a quantitative um, transcriptomic uh, conversion phenotype uh, across different disorders. And whether these measures can give us uh, more clues to the neurobiology uh, involved. And so some of the proof of principle work um, done in the, the Geshwin lab, at least looking at, at autism, um, uh, this was uh, work that was published in 2016 by Neil Parikshak and, and others. Um, and this was comparing um, about 50 cases of autism and about 50 controls across three different brain regions, frontal cortex, temporal cortex, and cerebellum, uh, using RNA sequencing uh, to, um, and we identify um, quite a number of differentially expressed genes in autism compared to controls. Um, this uh, uh, plot here is showing the p-value histogram, um, and you can see inflation towards the zero, showing that there's a, a quite a, a big signal of differentially expressed genes in autism, um, is specifically in the cortex. So this is a, a combined analysis of frontal and temporal cortex, um, whereas the 
differential gene expression uh, patterns in the cerebellum were, were very attenuated. In fact, none of these actually passed uh, multiple comparisons correction, um, pointing to a sort of cortical specific uh, transcriptomic dysregulation. Um, here I'm just showing a, a heat map of the top 100 uh, genes, uh, z-scores z for genes, um, and clustering cases and controls based on those. It's just more for um, visualization purposes, but you can see that the ASD cases are largely clustering together, and the uh, control cases are largely clustering together, and it's not being driven by things like a uh, brain region or age or, or gender. Um, interestingly, we also had a small number of cases uh, in this cohort of autism who had a known a defined molecular diagnosis. This is a duplication on chromosome 15 uh, resulting in Duke 15 Q syndrome, um, which is highly comorbid with autism. I think about 60% or, or higher uh, of individuals with a Duke 15 Q CNV uh, also have a, a diagnosis of autism. And we were able to uh, compare the transcriptomic signature specifically in DUP15Q uh, and in idiopathic autism. Uh, in this figure here, I'm showing you the effect size for differentially expressed genes in autism, idiopathic autism, compared with the effect size of differentially expressed genes in DUP15Q syndrome. And what you can see is there's a strong, significant uh, linear relationship uh, between the two, suggesting that what we are observing in, in uh, dup 15 uh, and, and one other point actually to make here is that most of these genes are uh, not in the dup 15 q region. In fact, most of these are transacting, uh, would represent transacting effects of, of the dup 15 q uh, copy number variants. And so this is suggesting that with e even a known defined genetic, um, uh, molecular genetic diagnosis uh, conferring risk for autism, that they uh, still have the same uh, generalizable transcriptomic pattern um, in the cortex as we observe in idiopathic autism. And one of the, so this is focusing broadly on, on gene, at the gene level of, of differential expression signature, but one of the key uh, insights um, from uh, Steve Horvath and, and others um, has been that uh, genes really do not act independently um, uh, in terms of their expression levels. In fact, they um, cluster together based on expression patterns uh, within certain cell types or subcellular compartments or uh, similar molecular, uh, molecular processes or pathways that they're involved in. And we can actually leverage the uh, natural variation in gene expression patterns uh, across our samples um, to cluster them in an unsupervised way into modules uh, that likely represents a sort of more coherent biological process. Um, and we can use this both to understand the pat what, what the patterns of gene expression alterations uh, mean at, at more of a sort of pathway level, and also to help deal with some of our, the multiple comparisons issue of contrasting 15,000 or so genes across a, a smaller number of uh, cases and controls. And so um, we use a, a technique called weighted gene co-expression network analysis um, that allows us to cluster uh, uh, genes into modules and some of the top principal components of these modules seem to uh, pull out the major cell types of the brain. Um, and so we can actually use this as a way of uh, essentially computationally deconvolving what the cell type specific signatures would look like within a bulk tissue, bulk homogenate uh, brain tissue uh, from, from autism. And so here I'm showing a number of modules of genes. So we identify about 25 modules of co-expressed genes uh, in, in autism and control brains. And then we can look to see whether the modules are up or down regulated themselves in, in cases versus controls. And what we find is that there are a number of modules that are upregulated in autism um, that uh, relate to specific inflammatory and immune uh, cells uh, signatures. In this case, a signature of, of astrocytes, or one of the modules is, is very much enriched for known markers of, of astrocytes, and a second module is enriched for known markers of microglial cells, both of which are upregulated in, in autism brain. And in contrast to that, we see a number of neuronal uh, or modules that are enriched for neuronal markers that are, are downregulated uh, in autism. Um, and this is beginning to give us a, an idea for some of the potential molecular you know, pathology that's really going on 
uh, in the brain samples of these individuals. And so um, to put these together into sort of a, a schema, we can think of common genetic variation, rare variation sort of converging on, uh, or potentially converging on altered uh, brain gene expression as a quantitative downstream intermediate phenotype. In this case, uh, pointing to synaptic or neuronal downregulation or dysfunction, as well as uh, upregulation of uh, neuroimmune inflammatory processes related to uh, astrocyte and microglial cell types. And perhaps this is getting us closer to understanding the processes contributing to abnormal circuit function and, and uh, clinical symptoms and, and ultimately the clinical syndrome of autism. Now, uh, this is... Um, this, uh, this work had been solely focused on autism, but uh, a lot of really very interesting uh, work has come out uh, recently showing that uh, um, at both phenotypic and genetic levels, autism shares a, a lot of overlap with other psychiatric disorders. Um, we've, we've known for a long time that uh, some of the adult or later onset psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder often share a number of, of similar symptoms or, or comorbid features. But uh, I think we're now starting to understand that there's really a spectrum of, across uh, a whole host of, of psychiatric disorders and that perhaps some of the social cognitive deficits in autism may be uh, related to or, or similar to the negative symptoms of, of schizophrenia or, or likewise. And Furthermore, work from the PGC and, and, and others, um, re really uh, seminal work has shown that there's substantial genetic correlation between um, what was previously thought to be distinct uh, uh, psychiatric disorders. And so the question is, can we expand this model here um, to compare and contrast across a, a host of psychiatric disorders where we have available uh, brain tissue and the ability to profile the transcriptome uh, in a similar way as what we had done for, for autism. And so for the second part of my talk, I'm going to discuss some of our, our recently published work. Um, uh, um, uh, comparing and contrasting um, the gene expression patterns across multiple uh, psychiatric mm -hmm. disorders. Um, to do this, we compiled uh, a host of, of uh, published data sets from gene expression microarrays uh, of cortex um, across individuals with autism, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, alcoholism, and match controls. And we developed a, a quite a um, intricate pipeline for normalizing and, and uh, correcting for potential confounding factors and covariates within each study uh, separately um, and balancing based on, um, on these factors uh, before uh, compiling them together and normalizing them. And, and then we were able to uh, run differential expression and network analysis to really compare and contrast the transcriptomic changes that, uh, that um, uh, pr are present in each disorder. And so this, this is a <clears throat> recurrent type of a plot that I'll show you here. Um, this is gene expression changes uh, in, in autism compared to a second disorder. Um, uh, oops, sorry. Let's see if I can go back. Oop. So uh, here each dot represents a, a single gene expressed in the brain of about 10,000. Um, and uh, the x-axis represents the effect size in autism uh, brain. So on the right would be upregulated genes, on the left would be downregulated genes. Um, and I'm plotting this against gene expression changes in a second disorder, in this case schizophrenia. Um, and what you can see is there's a significant positive linear relationship between um, gene expression changes in, in autism and schizophrenia where you, genes that are more that are upregulated in autism are more likely to be upregulated in schizophrenia, uh, and we can quantify this by experiments correlation, um, which gives sort of a rough, rough estimate of the the sharing of these transcriptomic signatures. And we find in in uh, the comparison of autism to schizophrenia that this uh, reaches a level of about 0.4, which is uh, highly significant uh, compared both just uh, using parametric uh, statistics as well as using uh, Bootstrap. In contrast to a disorder like chronic alcoholism, uh, we don't see any significant positive or, or any really significant relationship at all, uh, which would suggest that these uh, changes are not being driven by something like uh, general uh, health issues or just a, a, an artifact of uh, postmortem uh, tissue. 
And now we can repeat these analyses uh, across a host of um, disease comparisons um, and begin to cluster, gene, uh, cluster disorders by how similar they are at the transcriptome level uh, in this data set. And what we find are, is a cluster of schizophrenia and bipolar showing the greatest degree of similarity, um, both of which also show similarity with autism um, and with depression uh, and alcoholism shows no positive significant relationship with any of the other disorders. We've also looked at a number of non-psychiatric diseases uh, from uh, GTEx, um, and we don't find any overlap of transcriptomic changes in brain um, in conditions like diabetes or heart disease, hypertension, asthma, uh, with any of the psychiatric diseases, suggesting this is not being driven by uh, some of the comorbidities that are associated with a number of these disorders. And we've also looked at uh, animal models uh, where animals were, um, uh, administered either acute or chronic doses of commonly prescribed antipsychotic medications or neuroleptic medications like haloperidol or olanzapine, um, and neither uh, n none of these treatments recapitulate the signature that we see uh, in these disorders. And in fact, if anything, there's actually a negative relationship, um, which we have very tentatively hypothesized perhaps represents uh, some of the um, mechanistic or, or could represent some of the mechanistic effects of, of some of these medications. Um, we've given that this is uh, microarray data that was um, uh, compiled together. We uh, spent a whole lot of time uh, making sure that um, the way in which we compiled the data together was not uh, driving some of these changes. And so we looked at a number of different ways of um, mitigating effects of batch and um, filtering genes together. And the correlations between disorders uh, remain the same uh, in, in each, uh, or were largely unchanged across these different comparisons. And so what we can then do is take the transcriptome similarity between uh, pairs of disorders on the y-axis here that we've measured from the brain and compare this to um, data from the PGC's 2013 uh, SNP-based um, genetic correlation paper uh, to see uh, does the transcriptome um, sort of follow the same patterns of shared genetic overlap across disorders that we see from, from GWAS. And we see this positive linear relationship suggesting that uh, at least a, a significant proportion of the gene expression changes that we're seeing in brain uh, may be related to shared genetic overlap across disorders. Perhaps not surprising, but um, interesting to see. Um, and in addition to looking at the degree of correlation uh, between each disorder, we can also measure the slope of the uh, association between the disorders. And so here I'm plotting effect size in schizophrenia uh, on the x-axis uh, for each gene expressed in the brain um, as a common comparison uh, with uh, autism in red here, uh, bipolar in green, and major depression in blue, um, three disorders that were all significantly correlated with autism at the transcript, or sorry, with schizophrenia at the transcriptome level. And we see that um, there's a, a striking difference in slopes between the, the three disorders where uh, changes in autism have about a five-fold increase a, a slope compared to schizophrenia, where schizophrenia and bipolar disorder have about the same slope um, and depression has a, a much lower slope. And this would suggest that the severity of the transcriptomic phenotype is, is much greater in, in autism compared to the other disorders and much less in depression than the other disorders. Um, and so this is looking sort of at a 10,000 foot view of, of all the genes that are expressed in the transcriptome, but uh, can we gain some specificity by um, partitioning these genes into specific uh, pathways and, and networks using our, our network analysis approach. And so we run WGCNA, uh, we identify uh, gene uh, in an unsupervised way gene co-expression modules, um, and indeed we find that the um, several of the modules, of the top modules, um, are reflective uh, or very strongly enriched for known markers of specific cell types within the CNS. So microglia, endothelial cells, neurons, astrocytes, and olig or oligodendrocytes. I'm not showing you that module because it wasn't um, changed, but we, we did find an oligodendrocyte uh, module. And the point here is that these modules are all very high, uh, strongly enriched for one specific CNS cell type. So this is a p-value of 10 to the minus 137, um, and it, it seems to be quite a binary 
uh, enrichment, uh, suggesting that we really are capturing or able to sort of computationally deconvolve the uh, the gene expression pa uh, patterns related to uh, specific cell types in brain. And when we do this, we identify a, a number of neuronal modules um, shown here. I, I've kind of clustered them all together because they're highly interrelated um, that were uh, largely enriched for um, neuronal markers, but also for uh, pathways involving synapse uh, and mitochondria uh, that are strongly downregulated in autism um, and downregulated in schizophrenia and bipolar to a lesser degree. Um, but not in depression and sort of see mixed effects in, in alcoholism um, going in, in both directions. I will uh, note that a number of, of genes here are, are quite interesting, um, which I'll talk about a, a little bit later, but one of them uh, has, has kept uh, popping up in, in some of our analyses and some of the PGC's analyses, and this is the neuronal splicing regulator RBFOX1, which is a hub of a the salmon module, which is uh, strongly downregulated in, in, in autism and, and other disorders. In contrast, we see an astrocyte module here. This is enriched for known canonical markers um, of astrocytes like SOX9 or GJA1 um, as, as hub genes, uh, the sort of the most connected genes in this module. Um, and this was upregulated uh, in autism, but also in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder to a slightly lesser degree. And then finally, we see a microglial module. Um, again, this uh, has known uh, very highly canonical markers for microglia as the sort of top hub genes. These include gene, um, genes like AIF1 or IBA1, which is what you would potentially stain a, a brain section for if you were to look for microglia. Um, other markers, including uh, TyroBP, um, is here, or TyroBP right here, or CSF1R, this is the um, target of a, a drug called PLX, which actually kills microglia uh, in animal models. And so um, all of the, the hub uh, genes, um, again, are, are, are very uh, strongly uh, related to, to microglial processes. Um, and this module is, is very highly upregulated in autism um, and actually slightly downregulated in bipolar and, and um, the other disorders, which we didn't make too much of in the the, the uh, previous paper, just given that the effect size seems small, and um, but I'll show you in our larger replication uh, data as part of the psych encode that we, we actually see some quite interesting uh, changes in schizophrenia bipolar in, in our microglial signatures as well. Um, and so we looked at gene uh, GWAS enrichment uh, among these modules and find that the, the neuronal modules are, are uh, strongly enriched for GWAS uh, across a host of um, psychiatric traits, including schizophrenia, bipolar, and, and uh, the iPsych autism uh, GWAS data sets. Um, and we also looked at enrichment for um, uh, rare variants, and so we compiled uh, rare uh, de novo uh, non-synonymous variants um, from several whole exome sequencing studies um, published a, a few years back um, and compared uh, enrichment in our modules for exome um, for rare variants identified in autism uh, and schizophrenia. These are non-synonymous variants uh, compared with siblings and controls um, that did not show this enrichment for, or, although they were uh, fairly close um, to the FDR threshold here, um, but then contrasting that also to silent variants uh, or synonymous variants did not show any enrichment. Um, and then finally, we compiled the list of recurrent copy number variants uh, affecting uh, that had been genome-wide, uh, I guess this was prior to the genome-wide uh, CNV association paper, but um, that, that had been recurrently associated with um, autism and schizophrenia and find that the genes uh, in these CNV regions uh, are also significantly enriched for our turquoise module, which is our, our main neuronal downregulated module. And so we can sort of expand on our model of disease pathophysiology uh, using this data um, to suggest that common genetic variation and potentially rare de novo variation or, in, or even rare inherited variation uh, potentially converges on synaptic dysfunction as its sort of proximal target. Um, and that that is then leading to astrocyte and microglial activation, which is what we see uh, very strongly in autism. Um, whereas in schizophrenia, we see um, uh, a lesser, um, less severe transcriptomic phenotype involving uh, synaptic and astrocyte uh, changes 
uh, and then bipolar, uh, a slightly even uh, less uh, severe phenotype as well. So uh, this, uh, this data was all collected uh, using gene expression microarrays um, and uh, it doesn't allow us, uh, which, which allows us to integrate um, gene expression changes, but there are a host of uh, additional kind of more complex transcriptomic features that we couldn't assess uh, using, um, uh, using microarrays such as splicing and isoform dysregulation. Um, and so we are uh, working as part of the like ENCODE consortium, um, which has compiled uh, approximately 2,000 uh, postmortem human brain samples um, that have undergone RNA sequencing, and uh, a large majority, a, a large subset of them have also had a SNP genotyping performed on them, um, and all the data has been processed through a uniform uh, processing pipeline. Um, to generate um, gene, uh, a, a number of different transcriptomic uh, features uh, kind of in a uniform way ac across all these um, brain samples. These include uh, 51 uh, unique individuals with autism, uh, over 500 unique individuals with schizophrenia, approximately 222 with bipolar disorder and about 1,000 controls. And so this has allowed us to both uh, uh, replicate the, the findings from our microarray data set, but then also to extend it to a number of distinct levels of transcriptomic organization. Um, so starting with the gene expression, uh, similar to microarrays, but then we can also look at um, imputed isoform level uh, expression changes or, or uh, differential transcript usage or transcript ratios. Um, we can also look at local splicing changes, um, contrasting uh, splice junctions um, at, at specific exon, uh, exon junctions um, in our data set. And then we can also look at both uh, protein coding and, and non-coding uh, gene biotypes, um, the non-coding biotypes uh, largely missing or, or not annotated on, on microarray data sets. Um, and then we also have SNP array data in, in a, a large subset of these. And the idea is then to integrate uh, these different levels together to try to sort of comprehensively contrast you know, where genetic risk is lying uh, in psychiatric disease brain um, and to begin to interrogate several features that hadn't received uh, as much attention prior, uh, such as this non-coding RNA, local splicing changes. Um, and then one, one thing I'll also mention is the fact that we have about a thousand controls um, that span the entire life uh, lifespan from age uh, from right after birth to to ninety years old allows us to begin to uh, create pseudo uh, time trajectories where we can look at how um, disease effect size magnitudes uh, change over time, and this can sort of point to uh, and help identify which transcriptomic changes maybe are more likely to be causally related to disease if they're showing um, peak uh, disease um, effect size magnitudes early in the course of the illness, or uh, alternatively, um, some changes may be more likely to be reactive uh, to, um, to a reactive consequence of having disease, which may increase in magnitude or, or appear later, uh, later in the course of the illness. So the first analysis that we did was just to look at differential gene expression um, in, a, in a similar way as what we had done prior in, in our microarray data. Um, and again, we find uh, a very substantial overlap uh, between schizophrenia here shown on the x-axis, autism and bipolar disorder. Uh, again, we see this very strong um, increase in transcriptomic severity in, in autism compared to schizophrenia. Um, and we find uh, a sub substantial transcriptome overlap that, that largely fits with, with what we had seen uh, from, from the microarray data set. But <clears throat> in, intriguingly, we can now begin to look at some of these other features and we find actually similar patterns uh, for some of them. So this is differential uh, local splicing. Um, so we used a, a relatively recently developed pipeline uh, from Jonathan Pritchard's group, uh, Leaf Cutter, which allows us to quantify uh, splice junction uh, or splice event or sorry intron clustering um, uh, re representative of, of lo local splicing changes and so here I'm showing uh, lo a change in, in PSI the percent inclusion of a, a, an intron cluster um, in schizophrenia um, compared to the same intron cluster either in autism or bipolar disorder uh, and again what we see is a, a substantial cross disorder overlap at the local splicing levels 
um, with this increase in the severity of the phenotype uh, for autism compared to the other, other disorders. And just to give you one example of what this looks like, this is GRIN1, the NMDA receptor um, obligate subunit, NR, the NR1 subunit on chromosome 9. Um, and this has a, an exon that's uh, known to um, differ across different uh, transcript isoforms of, of NMDA receptor uh, NR1. Um, and we had previously shown in, in autism uh, that the exon 4 here um, is more likely to be skipped in, in autism than compared to uh, control samples, uh, which we indeed find again. Um, and we also see the same uh, pattern in schizophrenia, although the, again, the magnitude, the effect sizes are, are slightly less. Um, intriguingly, this is also a known target of, of RBFOX1, which I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, which is a known splicing regulator related to uh, activity dependent gene regulation. So th these are the first two levels of transcriptomic organization, but we can also look at isoform level changes. And, and this is where um, we, uh, we focus actually uh, quite a bit in, in um, this analysis, given that this is actually where we see the more disease specific uh, effects. And so when we impute isoform levels, um, isoform expression levels and look at uh, comparison of effect sizes across disorders, we, we, uh, we see a, a substantial attenuation of that cross disorder signal that we had seen at the gene and the local splicing levels. We also see uh, much larger effect sizes um, in cases versus controls at the isoform level than the gene level. And so what I'm showing you here are uh, the number of genes with uh, an FDR uh, uh, of less than 0.05. Um, genes, uh, th these are histograms, um, and the, the upward uh, axis is referring to upregulated genes, the down axis referring to downregulated genes, and then across autism, bipolar, and schizophrenia. And the, uh, the bins that are uh, pink are, are gene quantifications, whereas the bins that are blue are isoform quantifications. And what you can see here is that we see substantial uh, differential expression across disorders, but that the uh, isoform level changes have the, the largest uh, absolute value of effect size here shown on the x-axis, um, suggesting that these have the, the, you know, the, the largest changes uh, in, in disease brain. And that are more, uh, more specific to each disorder, uh, as I had shown uh, on the previous slide. Uh, we can look at how these different um, different features relate to genetic risk uh, for disease. And so here I'm showing, um, I'm contrasting differential gene expression um, across each disorder uh, in each color with differential transcript or isoform level expression um, with polygenic risk for disease uh, calculated within the same samples. And, um, and for the subset that we, we had genetic uh, SNP array data on. Um, Interestingly, we can see that the, and, and this is the, the first principal component of the differential expression signature, allowing me to uh, collapse it to a single point and, um, and show you what the correlations look like across these different features. And so uh, the take home point here is that differential transcript expression and differential gene expression actually are, are quite substantially correlated with each other, um, uh, a little bit higher than we, we would have expected. Um, uh, but, uh, or at least at the first principal component. Uh, but when we look at how those features relate to polygenic risk for disease, um, it's uh, the differential transcript expression that shows the greatest correlation with, with PRS, although differential gene expression was also uh, associated significantly uh, with genetic uh, risk, at least for schizophrenia. Uh, here I'm also uh, now just taking the actual uh, genes or transcripts that were differentially expressed and looking to see uh, how enriched are those features uh, for GWAS signal uh, across the three different disorders. Um, we use two different methods, partitioned uh, LD score regression or, or MAGMA. Um, and what we find is um, enrichment uh, specifically of, in schizophrenia of GWAS signal um, uh, with the highest enrichment in the downregulated uh, differentially expressed transcripts uh, compared to um, upregulated differentially expressed transcripts or the downregulated differentially expressed genes. And so this tells us um, that we, uh, we think that the, uh, you know, the transcript isoform level features are, are really a quite interesting um, area of, of neurobiology to explore in terms of understanding the mechanisms of, of genetic risk for disorders. Um,
and uh, very much in, in line with with recent work. Um, I think from uh, from Andrew Jaffe and Danny Weinberger's group um, looking at, at schizophrenia uh, isoforms, which is um, overdevelopment. Um, and then a, a, a last. Um, area that we can contrast the gene versus isoform level quantifications is that we see um, well, we, we actually can make uh, separate networks using uh, gene expression quantifications or reputed isoform expression, um, which we've done, and we can then contrast what the modules are and, and uh, captured uh, using each feature um, and then try to both relate them to each other and relate them to disease uh, phenotypes and disease GWAS um, signal. And what we find here is that the um, isoform level module, so uh, isoform and gene level modules often capture very similar processes. Um, and in fact, they often almost completely overlap. So we usually find for each gene um, module, an isoform specific module that, that is nearly the identical in terms of its hub genes and, um, and gene set uh, membership. Uh, and phenotypic association. But what's really interesting is that we are able to identify several um, more specific isoform level modules that seem to be capturing specific uh, aspects of biology that are, that are really not present at the gene level. And so here I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I mentioned RBFOX1 previously. Uh, this is a, a very interesting um, splicing regulator that uh, has recently been linked uh, to um, major depression in um, the most recent GWAS, as well as I believe there's a, a genome-wide significant schizophrenia um, association in one of its introns uh, from the Cause UK data set. Um, and we have previously identified uh, three modules um, in which RBFOX1 plays a, a central role um, in, in autism and in our cross disorder data sets um, as, a, as a hub gene. And these three modules largely overlap um, with each other. And um, when we look in our um, isoform level expression, we actually are able to partition out two specific isoforms of RBFOX1 as hubs of two very specific modules. Um, and so what we find is that on the left, uh, this is a, a module where this is the predominant brain expressed isoform of RBFOX1, um, at least according to GTEx. And this uh, module is very strongly uh, downregulated in, in autism, but we actually don't see changes in the other two disorders, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, uh, in this module. And these genes are all quite interesting um, in that they are all, many of them are, are known to be uh, epilepsy risk genes or, or um, uh, associated with rare uh, epileptic syndromes. Uh, in contrast, we see a second module here. This is um, the second most uh, abundant isoform, uh, according to GTEx, in the brain. Um, and this is um, a module that's downregulated in autism uh, and schizophrenia. And while both modules are enriched for synaptic uh, terms and, and synaptic plasticity, they, they appear to be capturing sort of different aspects of biology that we're, we're really interested in trying to continue to, to tease out the, the differences. Um, and so that I think kind of gives a, a flavor of um, some of this uh, psych encode data in terms of um, understanding how different transcriptomic levels of organization uh, relate to uh, disease effects. And one last example um, or area of investigation that we've looked at is to uh, take some of our, our modules and to look at pseudo time trajectories across age um, and to be able to uh, think, uh, think about and potentially make some inference about the, um, the ordering or, or the, the timing of some of these inflammatory events that, um, or inflammatory signal that, that has uh, been seen in, uh, for quite some time across a number of different psychiatric disorders at the, in the brain level and also actually in peripheral markers. So here I'm showing you our astrocyte module uh, from our, our microarray data <clears throat> that was upregulated broadly. And we were able to find uh, almost the uh, same identical module uh, in our much larger psych encode data set um, that also shows um, significant disease upregulation, uh, although slightly less so in, in bipolar disorder than, than previously. Um, but what's really interesting is that we are actually able to partition the signal further into a, a second pathway that seems to be acting slightly um, 
slightly independently from the astrocyte signal itself, but that seems to be capturing a lot of similar disease variants. And this is a, a pathway um, very strongly enriched for the NF kappa B signaling um, pathway uh, and um, potentially the, the TNF um, and TNF signaling pathway as well. Um, and interestingly, this module it is strongly upregulated across all three disorders. Um, uh, and um, and we can take these modules and then uh, plot what the trajectories look like uh, across all of our samples. And so here I'm showing you the age of all uh, like 1800 or 1900 uh, psych ENCODE uh, brain samples. Um, and then the colors uh, refer to the trajectory of the, the module expression over time. Um, the gray lines here are the control samples. Um, and then the different colors correspond to each disease group. And so uh, what you can see here, for example, in our astrocyte module is that there's a strong upregulation in, in autism compared to controls that sort of parallels a, across the lifespan. Uh, in contrast to, to, uh, to autism, when we look at schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, uh, we actually don't see uh, much of a separation from controls um, until we reach um, midlife, uh, 50, 60, 60 years old. And this actually doesn't reach significance for bipolar, but it, it does for schizophrenia. But this suggests to us that maybe this is more of a reactive um, effect in disease rather than something that's um, a causal driver, uh, of, at least of schizophrenia, um, and, or, or causally indicated, indicative of the pathophysiology of disease. Um, in contrast, uh, this is the NF-kappa-B signaling uh, module that we find um, upregulated across all three disorders, um, but in, in autism actually seems to separate greatest from controls at a little bit later of a time point, like maybe age 20 or so, um, whereas in, in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, it, it seems to separate around the time when um, we would expect symptoms to begin manifesting uh, in, in late adolescence or, or, adult, or early adulthood. Uh, we also find this microglial module, which I had showed you before in our, um, our microarray data. And again, we find a, a very, very similar uh, module that has almost all the same hub genes like Tyro BP and, and AIF1. Um, AIF1. And um, in contrast to what we had seen before, we now see, uh, or we, we still see um, autism showing strong upregulation of this module, but then both bipolar and schizophrenia are now uh, significantly downregulated. And this module also splits into a, a second uh, pathway that we see, which is a, an interferon response pathway. Um, it's a very small module, but all of these genes, actually there's, I think, 61 genes, and 59 of them are known to be upregulated following exposure to interferon um, in, in uh, animal models or in human cell lines. Um, and this is remarkable given that it's, it's very, very strongly upregulated in autism and also slightly in, in, in uh, schizophrenia as well. And when we look at the trajectories of, of these modules, um, for microglia, we, we again, this looks very similar to what astrocytes look like in, in autism, um, where there's an, a sort of an upregulation of, across the lifespan. Um, intriguingly, in, in bipolar and schizophrenia, this microglial module actually dips below the controls, but again, this is a sort of a later effect around age 50, it looks like. Um, whereas uh, the interferon response really seems to peak uh, in autism very quite, quite early. And so we're very intrigued by the, um, by the meaning of this and, and whether we can understand what, what uh, the causal drivers are potentially of this, this uh, transcriptomic change. Uh, and so just trying to put all of these together um, as a very simple model um, of disease pathogenesis, uh, this is what I'd sort of previously shown you for autism, where we have, you know, common and rare genetic variation uh, converging on some aspect of synaptic dysfunction that we think um, microglial and astrocyte activation is uh, sort of more reactive uh, um, or secondary consequence from that. Um, and we're able to now sort of add this, inter or this early interferon response um, as, as even uh, slightly earlier than the microglia and astrocyte signaling pathways um, in autism. And then what looks to be a, a later uh, increase in the NF-kappa-B signaling pathway um, that uh, are um, sort of present in the, the autism uh, uh, postmortem uh, gene expression uh, patterns that we see.
In contrast, uh, when we look at schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, um, it seems that the NF-kappa B signaling pathway seems to be much more of a, an earlier proximal effect um, and that the astrocyte in increases in astrocytes and, and decreases in, in uh, microglial markers seems to become secondary to, to that signaling pathway. Um, and that we see this sort of amalgamation of, of uh, gene expression alterations in schizophrenia um, and lesser degree in bipolar disorder. And so I, I understand this is a, a pretty simple kind of working hypothesis here, but this is sort of where, how we think these data kind of fit together um, into a sort of a coherent narrative, um, although we're actively working to, you know, better understand the, the causal drivers and the, the timing and trajectories of, of these features. And I think that's all I have. So with that, I'd just like to thank um, um, my lab and, and members of the Geshwin lab. M most of this work was done uh, in, in uh, tight collaboration with the Geshwin lab, as well as um, the Psych ENCODE project, which has been really uh, instrumental in, in getting all of these uh, data sets together um, and uh, making uh, quite a, a great resource that should become publicly available uh, in the near future, I believe. Um, with, with all these brain samples, um, as well as our, our funding sources from NIH and the Simons Foundation, and particularly also to the individuals in the brain banks that, that collect these, these tissues, which are, are quite hard to, uh, to come by. And, and so uh, we, and we um, you know, greatly appreciate all, all the families that, that make that decision. We think it's, it's, it's very important for, for understanding uh, disease process. And, Thank you all for your attention. And, and with that, I think I'll, uh, I'll take your, your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. That was an incredible amount of uh, excellent work. Thanks very much. Um, we have a couple of questions um, so far. So uh, we've one from Dave Kersis, uh, who's asking whether there might be routes that go from gene to psychiatric disorder that don't pass through uh, effects or are mediated by effects on expression. So don't we expect that there will also be some direct effects on function, such as with rare coding variants? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and we certainly are, I don't think our model uh, excludes that at all. And um, uh, I think that um, what we would uh, hypothesize is that rare coding variants, uh, particularly in some of the synaptic and chromatin modifying pathways, um, can you know direct have a sort of direct proximal effect in disrupting the the function of that gene, but that we would expect then to have a sort of a cascade of, of downstream effects. For example, if you have a a, a mutation in a, a chromatin modifier, say um, CHD8 in autism or set uh, D1A in, in or one yeah D1A in schizophrenia, that the effect will actually potentially have um, a, a cascade of, of uh, consequences on, on gene expression downstream of that and uh, that we could uh, definitely be picking up. Um, or if you had some kind of synaptic dysfunction conferred um, by uh, a rare coding variant that the system, uh, given that the, the brain and the gene, these gene expression patterns are, um, is a sort of finely tuned system, will we'll adjust to that. And, and so I think actually what we're picking up a lot of is, is, this, is these, these downstream consequences rather than the sort of proximal cis effects of genetic variation. Thank you very much. So there's a second I question here hear from, you, Andrew. Uh, from Edna. Um, so Edna Grumblatt asks, uh, do you correct for the various- I, I lost my audio. Oh, you can't hear me. Mm. Oh, um, can you hear me now? I see a second question from Edna Grun Grunblatt. So maybe I'll try to answer that because I can't actually hear anything anymore. I don't know what happened to my audio. Oh, there it is. Oh, oh we're back. I hear you now. Well, you, 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 it's probably better, it's safer if you answer the, uh, answer the question in, in this particular case. Just in Okay. Case. Did you correct the various gene expression in ASD to the age of the probands? And ASD started, yes. So we, we've, um, we have uh, looked very carefully at, at, at um, age-matched cohorts and different ways of correcting for age. Um, and we, d we definitely see um, age effects on gene expression in general, so that's definitely something that we've uh, taken um, very carefully into account when we do our differential expression analyses. Terrific. So can I, can I ask you a question about depression? Because yes. depression looks to be um, uh, 
an outlier in terms of the psychiatric disorders that you've examined that the expression changes in the modules didn't seem to go in either direction in most cases they it wasn't a consistent pattern and and when you got to, when you came to talk about inflammation and you separated the inflammatory module out into two separate modules uh, depression wasn't in the second graph so i just wondered since since inflammation is you know quite it's something that's quite frequently implicated in the path pathophysiology of depression if not it's etiopathology then do you, do you see anything when you look at the submodules with depression or do yeah, you just it's a it's a great question and something we're super interested in looking at the reason that we did we were not able to to show that in the second panel that the graph you're talking about is just because um uh, we actually didn't have any RNA-seq data from uh, samples of depression as part of the psych encode consortium and so in f the psych encode um, data set actually was specific for autism bipolar and schizophrenia and so we just weren't able to uh, get that data together um, to integrate it in the same uniform uh, way uh, with other data sets. But you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, it, it would be very interesting to look at depression. Um, and I know that some other folks have, have been looking at uh, measures of depression. Um, and I, I can comment sort of indirectly in that um, Eric Nessler's group just had a really lovely uh, paper looking at the transcriptome, the sex effects, sex specific effects of uh, uh, transcriptome dysregulation and depression. And they identify this module of genes that are all very important for uh, activity dependent gene regulation. And some of these are immediate early genes like um, ARC and FOS. And, um, and they actually point to this, this new uh, rel relatively unknown gene called DUSP6. We actually find a very, very similar, almost identical module in our data set in, in, uh, across psychiatric disorders and um, that's, that's downregulated also in, in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And, and so I think uh, that there, there is a, a fair amount. And, and in fact, that module is also, um, was also uh, regulated by psychiatric medications in our animal studies and so in, in opposite directions too. So SSRIs actually sort of reverse the effects, the downregulation, whereas antipsychotics actually had the opposite effect. And so we think that, that that's a very interesting um, area of biology for, for dissection of, for further dissection of, you know, depression and, and um, stress response and, and things like that and, and potentially in, in psychiatric medications but we we just didn't have the, the brain samples to uh include depression in this large-scale uh, me mega-analysis okay thank you very much uh, we have another question now from danny weinberger and i think tammy is going to attempt to turn his audio on so he can ask it himself hello danny i'm there um Zoom is telling me, uh, let's see, uh, Dr. Weinberger, are you able to speak? Zoom told me he's running an older version. It may not be compatible with the audio features. Um, uh, are you there? If, if you're not, I propose that we just wait another five seconds or so. If uh, he doesn't appear, I'll, I'll read it out. Okay, so uh, I'll uh, read it out very basically. I'm curious about the age trajectory of the astrocyte module in controls from 20 to 70, which looks pretty flat, but in uh, brain astrocytic density increases substantially across this age range. How do you understand that? Yeah, that's a really, uh, that's a good question. Um, we, we do see an increase in astrocyte expression, although I think it happens later than, than 70. I think it's more towards the 80s and, and early 90s. And so um, that's definitely something that's, that uh, I'm, I'll be interested to, to follow up in and, and to think about some more. Okay, and then we've got a question from uh, Justin Shi. Uh, are any results derived from data at protein level? Yeah, it's a great question too. Um, we don't have um, data at the pro, let me think. Um, well, so, uh, so, I mean, some of these findings have been, like individual genes uh, in some cases have been uh, validated using um, immunohistochemistry or Western blots, but I, I think what you're probably asking is sort of the more network level. Um, and it's, 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 uh, it's something that, Technically, it requires a lot of brain tissue, and it's not something that we're able to really do with in high throughput fidelity at the moment. But it's it's certainly some uh, a way that the um, field seems to be moving, uh, especially in, there's some interesting Alzheimer's uh, papers um, using 
the liquid chromatography mass spec analyses to characterize protein expression um, from brain tissue that, that has some, that's some interesting uh, findings. Thank you. Um, we, we don't have any other questions at the moment. Uh, is anybody, would anybody like to ask a, 